All right, so tonight's topic, the church, the pillar and bulwark of the truth that we just heard announced now from 1 Timothy 3.15. Essentially, yes, this talk tonight is about the church, but ultimately it's about authority. What is the authority for Christians? What did Jesus Christ himself leave behind? What did Jesus Christ himself establish? Who or what should Christians listen to when it comes to wanting to know about the true revelation from God and answers to everyday issues that are arising constantly in our world? Now, in the advertisement for this talk, I read that you know, Catholics are accused of many things. Um, that's not surprising. My book at the back, Defend the Faith, deals with at least 200 accusations, and there's plenty more than 200. But the accusation is, is that the Catholics listen more to the church than the Bible, more to the Pope than Jesus Christ himself. Is this a legitimate accusation? Do we ignore Jesus, do we ignore God when we're listening to the church? Do we relegate the Bible as secondary when we're listening to the church? Or is this a false dichotomy, as we put it? Is this a groundless accusation, an unnecessary division between God and the church, Christ and the church, the Bible and the church? Okay, we'll discuss and answer these questions tonight. Ultimately, for all Christians, whoever they are, wherever they are, the ultimate authority is God. There's no question about that. God is the source of all authority. Whether that exists in the Bible, whether that exists in the church, whether that exists in a bishop or the bishop of bishops, that is the bishop of Rome, the Pope. All authority comes from God. The only question is really, how is that authority mediated to us? How does God's will, God's word come to us? Does it come immediately? That is with no intermediaries between us and God, us and Christ, us and the Holy Spirit? Or is it mediated through an institution or a body or a group of people that have been invested with certain authority. My argument is in favour of the second view here. That in fact, when we look at Scripture, because no one doubts Scripture, no one denies Scripture, no one is relegating Scripture. When we look at Scripture, firstly, as a historical document, what do we read? What do we see? Well, one thing we don't see, or one person we don't see today, is Jesus Christ himself personally walking the earth as he did in those early decades of the first century AD. Our Lord ascended into heaven. We commemorated that in the liturgy yesterday, and we'll do it again on Sunday, the ascension of our Lord into heaven. It's a great mystery. Why did Jesus go back to the Father to be at the right hand of the Father? Why didn't Jesus just stay on earth, prove that he'd risen from the dead to everybody, including his enemies, set himself up in Jerusalem on top of Mount Zion and rule from there and send out everyone to convert the world and everyone will be able to see Jesus risen before them. And it would be very simple, very easy. You'd think the whole world will now be believing in Jesus who'll be still alive after 2,000 years there enthroned on Mount Zion in Jerusalem or outside Jerusalem. But that's not the path he took. That's the mystery. He ascended into heaven to be at the right hand of the Father, our advocate, our intercessor, our high priest, the one eternal high priest of the heavenly temple, still offering in a sacramental form the same sacrifice he offered on Mount Calvary. What we read in the Acts of the Apostles in the first chapter there is that when our Lord ascended into heaven, he left behind a group of people. There was 120 of them there on Mount Olivet, men and women. But there was a certain group of men there that had a particular 
power and authority that was invested in them. We're going to have a look at this. And we're going to have a look at the scripture to identify this, these powers, this authority, that this, yes, I'll dare say the word, exclusive men had. And we'll understand that what our Lord established or founded at that moment continues today. All right. We had St. Peter. We had 11 other apostles. Even though Judas had hung himself, Matthias was elected to replace him. We had Our Lady. We had the Holy Women. We had up to 120 people there on that Mount Olivet that day. What did Jesus leave in their hands? Did he hand out copies of the New Testament? The Old Testament was there. The, the Old Testament will be quoted 350 times to be embedded in the, in the Gospels and Epistles of the New Testament. Over 300 of those quotes will come from the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which was written for the, he, the Jewish people in the diaspora outside of Palestine, mostly in Egypt, for example. But our Lord did not hand out copies of the New Testament. Yet, the truth, the gospel, had already been delivered once and for all to the saints. It, exi it existed, the gospel, the good news, existed in that nascent church, that newly born church of 120 people at that moment. But what form did it exist in? It existed in oral form. It was, it was deposited in the bosom of the church orally. And that's how it would be passed on in the first few decades. The first book of the New Testament that was written, according to scholars, were well, not the Gospels. Probably St. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians in the late 40s, maybe around the year 47. Plus or minus, we, we don't know for certain the precise dates. So that's about 17 years after Jesus has ascended into heaven. So what was the gospel for Christians in those early years? There was nothing yet written that was exclusively a Christian work embodying the gospel message and the teachings of Christ in those early years. Yet people were being converted, being baptised, attending the liturgy, receiving the Eucharist, receiving instruction, having children, having those kids baptised, passing on the faith to their children, already without any written gospel or New Testament epistle or anything else. What was their authority? What was their guide? Who did they turn to? It was the apostles. It was the apostles headed by St. Peter. And it was their, their successors that they actually ordained through the laying on of hands from one generation to the next, even in their own, starting with even in their own lifetime. We call this initial deposit of the gospel orally in the bosom of the church as the paradosis. That's a Greek word, the paradousis. It actually translates as tradition. Now I say that deliberately because in this debate about authority, it's not just the church that's challenged as a divine teaching authority. Those who advocate scripture as the highest authority usually advocate it as the only authority and therefore they deny tradition or the oral tradition or what we call the apostolic tradition and tradition has become a bogey word because weren't the Pharisees accused and condemned for attaching themselves to the traditions of men over and above the written word of God and that's another accusation that Catholics often receive but in actual fact the gospel originally was oral tradition. And tradition is not an evil word. It's not a bogey word. Tradition is a good word. It just, it derives, it's an English word, but it derives from the Latin tradere, to pass on from one generation to the next. 
And that passing on wants to be protected by the Holy Spirit, working with the church, working with the legitimate authority, that is the apostles and their successors. We know that the original gospel was oral. The written scriptures actually tell us that as historic documents. I'll give you some quotes here. Acts 2.42, Romans 10.17, 1 Corinthians 11.2, 1 Corinthians 15.3, 2 Timothy 2.2, 1 Peter 1.25. Furthermore, it's clear again from the same scriptures that there was no intention ever that all the original oral deposit, the oral gospel, was intended to be put in writing. There's no such command from God. There's no such revelation from God. There's no such record of that. And that's intimated to us in other verses in Scripture. John 20, 30. John 21, 25. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty four. 2 John 12 and 3 John 13. Now, let's refocus ourselves at this point. Let's look at the title of the talk again. The church, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. The word church, where does it come from? What's its origin? Well, it's an English word now, but let's go, let's look at the chain here. Actually, it goes back to a Greek word. Church, this is a chain that I once came across. I presume it's correct. If it's not correct, it's very close to being correct. Okay. Church in English comes from kirk in Scottish, which comes from kirsch in German, but goes back to ecclesia in Latin, which goes back to ecclesia in Greek. And ecclesia means the chosen ones, the chosen community. Okay? Now, when we think about church, we might think about a local parish, we might think about the building itself, we might think about the community of believers, the baptised faithful, we might think about Rome and the Pope and great cathedrals in Europe and St Mary's Cathedral, etc. But essentially, at its core, the church are the baptised members of Christ. But within that, there are many callings. There are many gifts. And there's, there are many authorities. Yes, hierarchically structured. Ordered. The ultimate authority, of course, is God. And all authority comes from God, as we said at the beginning. But let's focus on scripture and what does it say about the church and how important the church is. The church is not a man-made institution like a club, like a sporting team, like a political party that can come and go and reach a zenith and then fade away, founded by someone at some point in time. It's a divine institution. Jesus intended to establish his own church. Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The I is Jesus. The my is his. The church is his. He founded it. This is the core principle point we must know in the beginning. The church, the only true church, is that one founded by Christ. Okay, comprehensively, the only true church. Being the founder of the church, Jesus naturally, of course, is its head. Now, sometimes you think Catholics believe the Pope is the head of the church, but they are wrong. The Pope is not the head of the church. No man is the head of the church. Only Jesus is the head of the church. Well, the good news is that, yes, Jesus is the head of the church. No one disputes that. He's the head of the church as king of heaven and earth. The church is his. He is the head. The church is his body. In old fashion language, we say it, was the, it is the mystical body of Jesus. Christ is the head of the church, his body. That's what St. Paul said, Ephesians 5.23. Now, there have been movements in the history of, of Christianity that 
broke away from the visible church or the Catholic church as we call it in the 16th century and said, well, the actual real church of Jesus is not this obvious uh, visible institution, but it's actually hidden. It's the true believers known only to Jesus or underground persecuted church. But in actual fact, Jesus tells us that his church must be visible. He, he says, as recorded by St. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, quote, a city built on a hill cannot be hid. This city is his body, his believers. It's not meant to be hidden and obscured. It's meant to be the light on the hill. Now, this church, yes, with made up of believers, baptised believers, it's going to be invested, as I said earlier, with power and authority. How do we know that? Where do we read that? Well, firstly, it was to have a hierarchical authority to govern it. Now, that's, you might take that for granted. You might like that. You might like the idea that the church has bishops and archbishops and cardinals and, and a pope and a succession of popes over the centuries and that your local parish priest is the, the local leader of the community here. But not everyone likes hierarchy these days. It's not fashionable. It's not trendy. We are, it's good to be egalitarian to a certain extent, but not absolutely. Because again, that's not how we find the church was ordered from the very beginning. We'll see later when we discuss Acts 15, what happened there. But from Luke 6.13 and Matthew 18.17 to 18, it's quite obvious that Jesus selected a certain group of men who'd have a, an authority, a power to govern, to teach, govern and sanctify over, over and above the so-called ordinary lay person. But... Again, cautious here, that power and authority is not meant to be self-serving. It's not for its own sake. It's a power and authority like Jesus' power and authority. A leadership that sacrifices itself and love for the greater good of its members. This church with power and authority is invested and sent on mission Whose mission? Jesus' mission. We know that. John 20, 21 is a great commission. All right, go out there, baptise all nations. That's what we read also in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28. This mission is Jesus' own mission. Let's understand here from the very beginning, and I, I will come to this later on again, but I want to plant this thought, this idea in your mind now. The church is simply the extension of Christ. It is the continuation of Christ and his presence in the world. Christ, it has Christ's power and authority to teach, to govern and to sanctify and to do everything Jesus himself did to continue his presence and his work in the world now. So why are we shocked? that we read in Scripture that Jesus is giving power and authority and authorising the church to do so many things. Again, the invest, it is invested with the power to bear fruit through sanctifying the faithful, John 15, 16. The church is invested with the power and authority to forgive sins, John 20, 23. Now this is shocking for many people, many people of goodwill. The idea that men can forgive sins, how abhorrent. Who's heard, put up your hand if you've heard the accusation, men can't forgive sins, only God can forgive sins. Who's heard of that accusation? I'm surprised you haven't all heard it. In fact, when Jesus said to the man who was in that stretcher, that crippled fellow, paralyzed fellow, who was lowered down through the ceiling by his friends, sons, your sins are forgiven, the same accusation was hurled at Jesus. How can he say this? Only God can forgive sins. Well, most Christians believe Jesus is God, so it's not a problem for Jesus to say that. But they draw the line there. They won't go further. They won't say that men have the power to forgive sins. That is a blasphemy. That's assuming something divine and giving it to humans. No, that's only a divine power. Yes, it is only a divine power. 
But it's the divine person, Jesus, who bestows this power upon the church, who gives the church this power. The first thing Jesus did when he rose from the dead was to appear to his 10 disciples who were in that room. Judas was dead and St. Thomas was elsewhere. And he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall hold, they are held fast. So it's not just the power, it's an authority that Jesus gives to these men, all these disciples who had PhDs and were scholars and were academics and brilliant men. No, 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 no. They are none of that. They are just fishermen and tax collectors and half of them couldn't read and write anyway. And Jesus gave this incredible power and authority to them to forgive sins. Why? Because the church is going to continue what Jesus was doing in the world, forgiving sins and reconciling humanity back with the Father. Nothing scary about that. Actually wonderful, something to be overjoyed about because it makes forgiveness of sins proximate to us, visible to us, present among us. That's something to be happy about, even though you might still be you know, a little bit anxious and nervous every time you go to the sacrament of penance, as I still am after 25 years. Okay, and to just wrap it up here at this point, the church also has the authority to teach. Matthew 28, 20, of course it does. Go forth, teach all nations, baptise all nations and teach them everything that I have commanded you. Why? Because Jesus is a teacher. He is the first teacher. The head is the teacher. His body will also teach. And authority to baptise, which goes simultaneous with that. Again, Matthew 28. Go forth, baptise all nations and teach them everything that I have commanded you. Now, we've, we've established without a doubt that Jesus is the head of the church, the head of the church he founded, the head of the community he founded and invested with power and authority to do many things, summed up in just to do what Jesus himself was doing while he was on earth, to continue his work. Jesus is the king. He is king, yes, yes, it's a monarchy. Again, that's not very popular. Only when you want to watch royal weddings is monarchy popular. Maybe if monarchy behaved better, it would be a little bit more popular. But Jesus isn't elected on four-year terms to be head of the church. He doesn't have to campaign every four years to stay as head of the church because he's king and he's king by virtue of being the founder of the church and a divine person. He's God. So, you know, I don't think he can do anything wrong and be voted out. But this king actually has a prime minister. Yes, he does. Like Australia, we have a monarch and we have a prime minister. Ancient Israel also had a prime minister. Wasn't called prime minister, was called chamberlain or maybe vizier. The Davidic kings, the kings of Israel, the house of, in the line of the house of David, Jesus comes from the same line. Jesus is the ultimate Davidic king. He comes from the house of David, even though it was impoverished by the first century AD. Doesn't matter. He was still from a kingly line. We read in Isaiah 22, verse 22, an instance where the king gives to his vizier, Eliakim, the power of keys to bind and loose to lock and unlock. It's a delegated authority. The king in that instance is not abrogating his authority, not just handing it over willy-nilly and forfeiting it, the exercise of it himself. No, he's delegating it to someone who now has vicarious authority. Vicarious, from whence we get the word vicar, The prime minister in ancient Israel, the chamberlain, the vizier, was a vicar for the king. Exercised the power of keys to bind and loose, a power that derived from the king, done in the name of the king. Now, when it comes to the New Testament, we see that not only reflected, but augmented. The ultimate Davidic king, Jesus Christ, also appoints his own prime minister. Matthew 16, 18. You are Peter, 
And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, that's another talk altogether as to what that means and how we understand it in the Greek. But let's keep it simple because it really is simple. You are Peter. His original name is Simon. They don't change names willy-nilly. They change names for important reasons. Abram to Abraham. Isaac to Israel. Mary is not called Mary by the angel Gabriel. She's called, uh, in Greek, kakaratomene, which means full of grace. It's a loose translation, full of grace. Or thou who hast been graced. She's called something that reflects something essential about her, hidden to us, but known to God. Simon is changed to Peter because he's going to be the rock foundation of Jesus' church. And then listen to the next sentence. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wow, what an authority. This man not only has, well, he hasn't yet. He's going to get it later. He's going to get the power to forgive sins. But at this point, he's given the keys to heaven. Now, I've given this talk many times. And when I used to be a teacher at St. Charles College, I used to always carry around a set of keys. Right? Because I had power and authority. All right? I was a deputy principal. And that was reflected in the fact that I had keys to certain doors other people weren't allowed to open. But I was allowed to open them because I was big and powerful. Now, the doors at St. Charles, as good as that school was when I was there, unfortunately do not rank on the same level as the doors to the kingdom of heaven. St. Peter had keys to bind and loose heaven. Now, what do we see here in Matthew 16? It's a reflection of Isaiah 22. The king, in this case Jesus, is delegating an authority to his prime minister, in this this case St. Peter, giving him keys, which always in the ancient world signified power and authority, to bind and loose, and to bind and loose heaven. This is enormous. So whether you think... St. Peter is significant or not. The the point is, ultimately, Jesus is handing over to him the keys to heaven. Now, that can't be ignored. And same with the other apostles. We read in Matthew 18, 17 to 18, they also have a power to bind and loose. But But when we read that chapter, you notice they don't get keys. They are given power to bind and loose, but not keys. The two work together. The Pope now is the head of the universal church, but he works in communion with his brother bishops who are the Lord bishops of their own diocese who have to govern the local church as the local pastor. And therefore they must make decisions. They also bind and loose, but it's always done in communion with St. Peter and his successor. All right, so you're beginning to convince me that, you know, men have been given certain power and authority, and it's really a serious authority, really serious power. But do I really have to obey them? Come on, it's the 21st century now. Loosen up. Democracy's, you know, in the vogue now. Even in the Middle East, it's getting popular, you know? We don't have to look at the Pope in this way anymore. But in actual fact, it's always been the case that uh, Christians have been asked to give obedience to their leaders. So, well, the, let, the author of the letter to the Hebrews, we read in chapter 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, even as men who will have to give account. Okay. Obedience is so important here to bring order and unity, unity especially. You'll find that St. Paul elsewhere will talk about Christians, the, the need for Christians to give obedience even to the civil leaders, the emperor, the magistrates. Because St. Paul acknowledged that what? What did we start off with in this talk? All authority comes from God. Same in the church. And so there falls upon us an obligation of obedience. It's not a servile, slavish obedience as if we're carrying you know, a heavy weight upon our shoulders. It's a liberating obedience. 
The apostles, when they obeyed Jesus, never had a problem. When they disobeyed him, that's when they had problems. Slavery, disobedience liberates and frees us rather than what most people think today. It somehow binds us and restricts us. To obey St Peter and the apostles is to obey Christ. The accusation is, remember, you listen to the Pope in more than you listen to Jesus. But this is a false dichotomy. This is a false division, a false conflict. St John says, records this in chapter 13, verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives anyone whom I send <coughs> receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So, the Father begets the Son and sends the Son into the world. And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. John 1, 14. Then the Son sends forth St. Peter and the, the other apostles. Go forth, baptise all nations. Receive the Holy Spirit. Teach them everything that I have commanded you. To obey the, the, the ones that Jesus sends is to obey him. And therefore to obey the Father. To reject the ones whom Jesus sends is by implication to reject Jesus and the one who sent him, the Father. There are consequences if one deliberately refuses to listen to this visible and teaching church. Matthew 18, 17. If, this is Jesus speaking here, the gentle, loving Jesus, if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's severe. That's grave. Because the church is meant to embody everybody, to include everybody. So Jesus wouldn't lightly want to see people shunned or excluded, unless for serious reasons. Luke 10, 16, Jesus is recorded as saying this, He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. In spirit, that's exactly the same as what we read in John 13, 20. This chain. All right, so this church has power. It has authority. It must continue to do the work of Christ in the world. It is headed by Christ. It has a prime minister appointed by Christ. We are obliged to obey it, to honour it, to love it, to respect it. But what guarantees do we have that this is going to last to the end of the world? Everything, by the way, that existed in the time of Christ has now passed away. If you look at the end of the first century, everything that existed, every power, Every authority, every empire that existed in the year 100 no longer exists today, except for one. And that's the church Jesus founded. Even though at the end of the first century it was minuscule, insignificant, ridiculed, abhorred, persecuted, bludgeoned to death. But that, that power, that authority, that body still exists today. Why? Is it because it's led by great men? Is it because we are so smart we can outsmart our enemies? Is it because we're cool, we know how to adapt, you know? No, no, it's because of this. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, John 14, 16. Because Christ is going to, he's going to leave us. Remember, he ascends into heaven. But at the same time, another advocate, another one to stand beside us. That's the Greek word parakletos, to stand beside you. Is going to be assisting the church, teaching the church, guiding the church, protecting the church, sanctifying the church. To be with you for 10 years, no. 100 years, no. 200 years, no. 1,000, no. 2,000, no, no, no. Forever to the end of the world. And then we have, there's some more quotes here. You know, the, John 14, 15, 16 is very rich when it comes to the Holy Spirit being sent by Jesus to the church. And we read again John 16, 13. I have yet many things to say to you, 
but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now that might seem a little bit contradictory as against something I said earlier. There's Jesus on Mount Olivet beginning to ascend into heaven. He leaves behind the church. The gospel has already been delivered once and for all to the saints. So what is this Holy Spirit coming to teach us many things we can't yet bear now? This, is, this preempts what we know in history to be all those controversies that have arisen, all those debates, all the theological controversies the Christological controversies, the various heresies, the councils of the church. I mean, let's face it, those 120 on Mount Olivet were not talking in terms like this. You know, do we understand the incarnation, Jesus is one person, substance, essence, etc., etc.? You know, uh, they did not have, the, do you understand transubstantiation, you know, and hypostatic union? They weren't talking like that. Then you look at the Apostles' Creed, it's pretty basic stuff. We believe in, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin. It's pretty basic stuff when you're receiving converts into the church being baptised. They didn't have to do theology exams. There wasn't Theology 101 or anything for, for them. So basically, over time, when, particularly after the church receives freedom after Constantine, you know, there's a, we're a li little bit more relaxed. We've got time to do more than just survive. We're going to think. We're going to contemplate. We're going to develop. We're going to argue. We're going to put forward theories. And then we're going to get into, go over the edge a few times and into heresies and battles and combats and schisms and etc. Et and the Holy Spirit is still there, though. It's still Jesus present in the world. It's not going to be allowed to collapse or fall apart. They gather together, the bishops, we know about those gatherings. Nicaea 1, Constantinople 1, Ephesus, Chalcedon, Constantinople 2, Constantinople 3, just, okay, there's from 325 to 680, then Nicaea 2 in 787, and on and on and on. The Holy Spirit works with the apostles and their successors to resolve these difficulties, to teach us to develop what we already have received more fully. And then we have that great quote, which is our title today, 1 Timothy 3.15. If I am delayed, says St Paul, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. When you talk to some people who are advocates of sola scriptura, in their heart of hearts, they are very passionate, sincere people good people who tell you the Bible is the source of all truth. But the Bible actually tells us the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. In the end, the Bible is, contains the word of God. But the word of God can be static. It has to be alive. And it's alive in persons. As we'll see later, there are many things the Bible cannot do. You might find that a little bit scandalous for me to say now, but there are many things the Bible cannot do. We'll see what later on. Then some people will say, look, you know, I don't need the church, I don't need the Pope, I don't need bishops, I don't need priests, because I can read the Bible myself, and I can interpret it myself, for myself, because the Bible is obvious, it's clear, and I have the Holy Spirit who will guide me and protect me and teach me. God is not going to be leaving me hanging and betray me. That's nice. It's neat. It's simple. It's attractive. But is it really the order of things that Christ intended to establish? No. Even St. Peter, what we read in 2 Peter 1.20, first of all, you must understand this that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Meaning that, yes, we are meant to read the Scriptures. We are me meant to pray for the assistance of the Holy Spirit, who will make our hearts docile and enlighten us and to, to be open and accepting of the truths that are in Scripture. 
in the scriptures, but the Holy Spirit is not going to suddenly give me all the background knowledge I need 2,000 years separate and apart from the time of the, these books were written to know the ancient languages, the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, the culture, the geography, the politics, to know the figures of speech and what they meant in the, in the, colloquial, the, in the colloquial language of that time and place. It's not going to, Holy Spirit is not going to give me an infused knowledge like sticking a thumb drive into your computer and suddenly it knows all things. Holy Spirit works on my heart and mind to enlighten me, to make me open to the truths that are there, but not to be an infallible interpreter for myself. And we know our private interpretation has sadly led to division, contradiction, which is always a scandal. Division and contradiction is never due to the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's the fingerprint of Diablo, Diabolos, the divider. That's another name in Greek for old Nick, right? Lucifer. His fingerprints you will probably find when you see contradiction and division, not the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 3.16, there are some things in them hard to understand, that is, the letters of St. Paul, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures, as they do the other writings. And this is the problem that still exists today. It existed in the first century and it still exists today. And I'm not questioning the sincerity of anybody who wants to read the Bible for themselves. But we must face a certain humbling reality. We are not equipped just by ourselves to know everything about the scripture. We are to read and know the scripture in the light of apostolic tradition, in the light of magisterial teachings, in the light of the church, because the scripture is born in, out of the heart of the church. The Holy Spirit doesn't just print out copies of the Holy Spirit and dis distribute them around the world. The Holy Spirit worked with pillars of the church. John, James, Peter, Paul, Matthew, Luke, Mark, to inspire them to produce these works. The Holy Spirit is working with the church to produce scripture and will always work with the church to teach from that scripture and to interpret that scripture. Who leads this church today? You said St. Peter and his successors. How many times have I said St. Peter and the apostles and their successors tonight? I haven't given any proof that they're successors. Who's to, who's to say they're really successors? They can claim to be successors, but where's the evidence in the Bible of succession? When I went to Italy in 1998, I remember being there in the cathedral in, Mil in Milan and I marvelled at the, the giant... Uh, marble plaques that were on the wall, listing all the bishops of Milan since the big late third century AD. Every one of them. Clearly in Milan there's been a succession for 17 centuries. But we actually have recorded succession of bishops even before that with respect to the city of Rome. Two ancient historians, Hegesippus, who wrote around the year 140, and St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who wrote around the year 180, provide us with identical lists of the bishops of Rome from St. Peter up until their day. So there's historical evidence of succession, but people would still argue, I'm not interested in history. I'm not interested in church fathers because they're outside of the Bible and that's all fallible. It's subject to error. I want proof in the Bible. Well, we do have proof in the Bible. You don't actually have in the Bible, there is such a thing as apostolic succession. You have it happening and it being recorded. The Father sends the Son. The Son sends St. Peter and the disciples. And then we read in the Acts of the Apostles, where do we find it? Acts 13, 2. And Paul and Barnabas, Saul and Barnabas, are called and they've had their hands laid on them by the apostles and they're sent forth. The Father, the Son, the apostles, 
Barnabas and Paul. And then we read in 1 Timothy 4.14, in Titus 5.10, St. Paul giving instructions to Timothy and Titus as to who, what qualities to find in a legitimate candidate, a proper candidate for deacon, presbyter, bishop, and to ordain only suitable candidates. So, Barnabas and Saul. Saul is Paul, and we know Paul historically has ordained Timothy, has ordained Titus, ordained Luke. And we read St. Paul instructing Titus and Timothy as to the proper qualities they should identify in a candidate to succeed them in Crete or elsewhere. Paul, Timothy and Titus, and the ones that Timothy and Titus themselves ordained. There's six, lay, there's six links in that chain so far. And that we know historically continues to this day. This is what Timothy, uh, St. Paul's second letter to St. Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, easy to remember. And what you have heard from me before many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So there's St. Paul instructing St. Timothy as to be careful who he will choose to continue this, the passing on of the gospel. And what about Judas? When he hangs himself, we read straight away the disciples get together. They engage in a really scientific method of drawing lots. And they choose Matthias to what? Succeed in the office of Judas Iscariot. Judas is hung, but the office is still there. The office of apostle remains. The, a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. The successors to the apostles are not apostles. They're successors to the apostles. But they carry on the power and authority to teach, govern and sanctify that Christ invested in his original twelve. Where's an example of how this all comes together and works for authority in the church? We'll soon wrap it up. It's in the Bible itself. Let's go through this example. Study Acts 15 to 9. Go home and read it. St. Paul has just come back with St. Barnabas after four years of missionary work in Cyprus and Central Asia Minor. They've set up seven new church communities. The vast majority of these new members that have been brought to Christ, that have been baptised, that are worshipping together, that are con converging around the table of the Lord and receiving his sacred body and precious blood, are Gentiles, pagans. And when St Paul and St Barnabas go back to, to um, Antioch, everyone's excited they're relating their stories over four years. And the Judaizers, those Pharisees, those Jews who were converts to Christ, but who still were attached to the Mosaic law, were demanding that these Gentile converts needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. They had to pass through the law of Moses to get to the law of Christ, to the grace of Christ. Was this correct or not? Strictly speaking, when you look at the scriptures that they had, and the only scriptures they had at the time were the Old Testament, that you would conclude from a sola scriptura position that circumcision was necessary for these converts. <coughs> Wasn't Jesus circumcised? So must his followers be. What was the answer? Where would they turn to? How had they decided? Were the Judaizers right? They felt they were right. They felt they had the backing of St. James. The, the apostle who was Bishop of Jerusalem. St. Paul and St. Barnabas said, well, we must be right. We haven't done anything wrong. Look at all those miracles that were happening among them. And the grace of God was clearly there. But there was nothing in Scripture that would decide it comprehensively. There was nothing in either camp inherently that had an authority over the other to make a decision that's binding on the other. So what did they decide? Well, go down to Jerusalem and we'll debate it, and we'll decide it there, because St. James is there, and St. Peter is there. Now, St. Peter was prepared. He was prepared beforehand. 
when he had the vision of the, the winding sheet that opened up and all the animals were on it and the voice of the Lord said, get up and eat. And St. Peter said, no, I can't get up and eat. They're profane. He's still attached to the Jewish prescriptions, his dietary prescriptions. Jesus said, there's nothing profane. Get up and eat. Meaning that that was symbolically representing the fact that the Gentiles are not unclean. They are meant to be brought into the church. And then St. Peter gets a knock on the door from some people sent by a fellow named Cornelius. And he gets taken along to the house of Cornelius. And there's the family of Cornelius there. And suddenly the Holy Spirit descends upon all of them. They're speaking in tongues. And this is the Pentecost of the Gentiles. St. Peter sees there that, yes, faith is what has justified them. They don't need to be circumcised. The new circumcision is baptism that Jesus commands in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. And that was it. And when you look at what the proceedings of the council, St. Paul and St. Barnabas speak. They relate what they did in those four years from 45 to 49. St. Peter speaks and everyone falls silent. St. Peter's voice concurs with the experience of St. Paul and St. Barnabas. The Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. Then St. James gets up and the Judaizing camp think, this is it, the cavalry has come, St. James will win the day for us. But he doesn't. St. James backs up what St. Peter said. And then, but St. James asks for a couple of concessions to appease the Judaizing camp. Okay? Okay, the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised, but they just have to abstain from fornication, which is basically what we all have to do. Yes, even in the 21st century. Okay. We're not new under the sun here. Our culture is just going back to what it used to be in the ancient world, except we do it better with science and technology. Okay. Abstain from fornication and from meat from strangled animals. Now, that's strange because... uh, an animal that was strangled was an animal that didn't have its blood drained. And so you can't eat meat with blood in, under the old Judaic Mosaic law. But that was not necessary. That was just a concession to the, to the Judaizers to appease them. Eventually that would be discarded or irrelevant, abrogated. But what's important here is what they say. This is the, this is the decision that they vote on and agree on. The bishops are there, the apostles, the the episcopate is there, those that have ordained as their successors or co-workers. There are presbyters there. They agree on this. The majority vote is for this conclusion. What do they do? They put it in writing. Then they say, as recorded in Acts 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They didn't say it just seemed good to the Holy Spirit. They didn't say it just seemed good to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us because they acknowledged that they were working, deciding this issue with the authority of Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. It's nothing new. That's what ecumenical councils have always done and will always do. Work in the name of and with the authority of Christ, guided and protected by the Holy Spirit. And then what did they do? They put their decision in writing to be disseminated through all the churches. And my idea, my thesis here is that the next 25 years of St. Paul, is it 25 years? Well, at least the next 18 years of St. Paul's life is working and preaching and teaching to defend the decision of the Council of Jerusalem against the Judaizers. When you read in St. Paul's letters that all those who don't consider him a true apostle, who work against him, who, who convince the Galatians to accept circumcision, these are the people who, have res- who are resisting the decision of the Council of Jerusalem while St. Paul and Silas are out there preaching and teaching and defending it. But why be so staunch in defending a decision of men, of the church? Because it's not simply the decision of men or the church. It's a decision of the the apostles and their successors who are the pillars of the church of Christ that he founded, a church that has power and authority to teach, to govern and sanctify, guided and protected by the Holy Spirit. Nothing new, nothing has changed 
from this model. It's the model of all ecumenical councils ever since. What guarantees do we have about this church? That it will last to the end of the world. Matthew 16, 18, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew 28, 20, and remember, I am with you all days, even to the end of the world. When that will be, I don't know. It wasn't May 21. I don't think it's going to be October 21. The end of the world, look, the end of the world, when, do, when is the end of the world? It's today. It was yesterday, it's today and it's tomorrow. Why? Because there are hundreds of thousands of people dying every day and they're going to personal judgment one-on-one -on -one before Christ and it's the end of the world for them. Sadly, very sadly, just before this talk, I got a phone call of a friend of mine who used to go to many of our talks who at the age of 46 just suddenly passed away with a heart attack. I just saw him three weeks ago when Jason Everett was here. He came to my table. How are you doing, Rob? And I said, how are you doing, Dave? What are you doing, Dave? Well, the usual, I'm just looking after my old mother. He had no idea that he was going to go before his old mother at the age of 46. The end of the world has come for Dave. Okay? Don't fall for prophets who want to give you dates and times and years. Live and work and believe and do good and avoid evil on a daily basis. All right, just to finish off here, to sum up, what can the church do that the Bible doesn't do? And this is not diminishing the Bible. Think of the two working together, the one in the bosom of the other. The church is the servant of the Word of God. It doesn't overrule the Word of God. It guards, it protects, it interprets the Word of God. The Second Vatican Council gave us some great novel insights into the church. You all heard about the sacraments and you identify the seven sacraments. But in actual fact, and this is a bit controversial for some people, but completely orthodox if understood correctly, Christ is the sacrament of God, meaning that he is a sign and instrument of the presence of the Father in the world, of God in the world. It certainly is. The church is a sacrament of Christ being the sign and instrument of Christ's continued presence in the world today. And the seven ritual sacraments are the sacraments of the church through which Christ and the Holy Spirit work immediately upon us and with us now. So imagine my chest here. Don't imagine too much about it. There's not much to imagine. But this represents symbolically the Father who sends the Son my arm who sends the church my hand, who has the seven sacraments, the fingers. Now, it's all working as one. If I was to tap you on the shoulder with my finger, I cannot claim, look, it's not me, it's the finger doing it. You say, you're ridiculous, Robert. You're touching me with your finger. No, no, my finger's touching you, not me. It'd be silly because my finger is intimately united with me through my hand, through my arm, through my shoulder, to my brain. It's one. It's the same with the church. God, Christ, the church, the sacraments, all work as one. It's to reinforce the idea that the church is not something man-made, separate and apart from Christ, but really Christ present still in the world as his body. And let's reinforce this with these last um, verses that we'll look at from Scripture. Christ gives the 12 disciples the authority to cast out demons and heal all disease. Christ is doing that, so will his church, Matthew 10.1. Christ gives to St. Peter the keys of the kingdom, as we said earlier, to bind and loose, and also to the disciples a power to bind and loose, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, to bind and loose, to teach, to govern, to sanctify, because Christ is teacher, governor and sanctifier. Commissioning the disciples to anoint the sick with oil, Mark 6.13, because Christ worked and healed the sick, worked on and healed the sick. Giving the disciples 12 thrones from which they would judge the 12 tribes of Israel, Luke 22.30. Isn't Christ the only judge? Yes, but Christ delegates authority to others to judge. Christ the head judges, Christ his body judges. Invest in St. Peter the responsibility to strengthen his brethren, Luke 22, 32, and feed Christ's sheep 
and lambs, John 21, 15 to 18. Because Christ is the good shepherd. His church will be shepherd. Christ is the strengthener. So will his church be strengthener? Commanding the disciples to baptise and teach the whole world to observe all the commandments of the new law. Matthew 28, 20, Christ gives us baptism born from his side on the cross. So his body will baptise and bring people into the body of Christ. Then breathing the Holy Spirit upon his disciples to empower them to continue his mission to forgive sins in the world because Christ is the great forgiver. So will his church. Now you notice here, the church is given power and authority to do things, not just to teach, to govern, to sanctify, to heal, to cast out demons. A book, a Bible itself can't do that. Christ does work in the world through the Bible. Christ does teach and sanctify in the world through the Bible. But we need that Bible in the hands of a living organism, a living body. Only a living body can be a teacher, a governor, a sanctifier, an authority to continue visibly the work of Christ in the world. All right. And to finally finish, the idea of the church as one holy, Catholic and apostolic. These are the traditional marks that help us to identify the church of Christ. Because we have a sad situation today as we've had for centuries. In fact, really, the whole history of the church, there's been a tragedy of schism and, and disunity and conflict, which is certainly not the will of the Father, not the will of Christ, and not what the Holy Spirit wants to, uh, to sow in the world. The church has to be one, because Christ is one. The truth is one. Christ said, I'll build my church, one church. St. John records that Christ says there'll be one flock, one shepherd. So the church should be one. It's holy. Not because we, the members, are all holy. We often fail. Every day somehow we fail. I know today I've failed quite a few times privately, in my office, you know, stressed out about certain issues. And I'm ashamed of that. But the church is holy because Christ himself is holy. The teachings of the church themselves are holy. It's meant to be Catholic in the sense of for all people. The one ark of salvation is meant to embody all people. Christ is not racist. He didn't stretch out his arms on the cross for only the whites, the Anglos, the Saxons, he didn't. It was for all people. The church is the universal arc of salvation. It's not nationally based. It's not restricted by geographical borders or political borders. And it's meant to be apostolic. That is, the true church will trace its history, episcopal succession and doctrine right back to the apostles themselves can show a consistent 2,000-year history, a train of chain of succession and a continued development of doctrine for 2,000 years. The church we belong to, this little parish here in the church here in Australia, belongs to a universal church. It's the same church Christ founded in Jerusalem back in 30 AD. It's the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And we're called to be true, to be good and beautiful within that church. Thank you very much.